I should be recording too much by anyone who wants to watch this. I can't hear a damn I word. The proper Everyone word keeps talking over the top of each other. Rubbish. This is just absolutely ridiculous. Hello everyone. Today up on the bench here we have this Toyota Corolla carburetor. This is off a 2E engine and we're going to strip it down and see what's inside. So I've had a few comments on previous videos about vacuum lines. In particular, how do you know what vacuum line goes where? Where should they go? So what I've done, at least for my case, I've just googled 2E vacuum lines. Pictures come up on Google and the best one I found was this one of a under the bonnet sticker. This was found on the Toyota Nation forum and it is pretty much identical to my setup. Anyways, as you can see, this is a dual Venturi carburetor. It has a primary and a secondary Venturi. These are known as the K-type carburetor. On earlier Corollas, they had a V-type carburetor, which was a single variable Venturi sliding type carb. They are generally regarded as less reliable and they have more complexity with them. And I'm not going to be covering them because to be honest, I've never really touched them. People usually throw them out in favor of this style carburetor and these ones work just fine. So this diaphragm down here is our vacuum operated secondaries and above it you've got those two diaphragms joined together. That is our fast idle breaker and then to the left of that is our auto choke actuator. So spinning this around to the back, here we have our accelerator pump. You can see this linkage here is coupled directly to the throttle linkage. And then we have our fuel cut solenoid, PTC heater, and right underneath that is the float bowl vent which will go out to the charcoal canister. Various connections for vacuum and coolant as well as that shrouded screw down the bottom for idle mixture. This here is our dash pot which stops backfiring on deceleration. Over here we have our choke breaker diaphragm. And this is obviously where the fuel goes in. And if you're lucky enough you'll have that float bowl window so you can see the level of fuel in your carburetor when the car is flat and level. Those two bungs on the bottom of the float bowl allow you access to the primary and secondary jet. So if your carburetor is not working like it used to, check the obvious first. Make sure that you have no vacuum leaks. Check for split hoses or leaking gaskets. Once you've ruled that out, then you can start messing with adjustments. So here on my magic piece of paper, you can see the things that I would probably adjust first. These are probably the most common things, and just check that everything is all okay. If you want a more detailed video on how to do this, check out my previous video. It's all there, mostly, sort of. So I'm going to check the PTC heater. This plug here and ground go between that on ohms with your meter and you should get a good result. Exact same thing for the choke actuator. Go between the pin and ground. So here we have our fuel cut solenoid and I'm measuring the resistance of the coil. But this does not tell me much to be honest. I need to verify that the spool inside of the solenoid actually moves and having a good coil might not necessarily be enough to have the spool move. You could have a gummed up or bad valve. So the best way to test this is to simply power it on with 12 volts and listen for a small click. If you can hear the click, then you know that fuel is going to make it to your idle circuits in the carburetor. So I'm sure there's a lot of people wondering what these components here are. These are basically metering valves. So uh, this is a good example here. This dash pot here, when the manifold vacuum is high, it is retracted. But if you step on the gas, it'll very quickly retract outwards. When you take your foot off the gas, the manifold vacuum becomes high again and it will very slowly pull itself back into its home position. So on a piece of paper here, air will be able to quickly and easily flow from the black to the red, but going from the red to the black, it is a lot more restrictive. These orange and black ones are used as well, but this is basically just a one-way check valve. You can think of it as a diode. So air will only be able to pass from the orange to the black, but not the other way around. Another interesting thing is these bimetal vacuum switching valves here. So this is only a two port version. There are three port ones on the manifold. And this two port one, this is basically com uh, completely closed unless this heats up, in which case that will connect that port to there. And I don't actually have a three port version on hand, but here's a picture of them. So when you heat them up, you can put them in hot water to get them to click over and you should have the air path change like so. So to get inside of this carburetor, first we're going to remove this automatic choke assembly here. So we're going to remove three screws holding on that retaining ring. Then we can remove those three screws there. Now 
Next, we can remove this clip. Now we can remove this clip here. Now we can remove this one here and all the screws on the top of this here holding down the uh, top cover. So whoever held the camera on this day was not very my good. My god, this video is so shaky. Oh my god, I'm so starting shaky. to feel nauseous. What's going on This yeah. is the worst really video ever. Thing. I wouldn't even bother fast. watching the rest of this. Just I just ridiculous. dislike it and move on with this. Life. So sometimes the gaskets tend to stick the uh, top of the carburetor down to the body of it. But in my case, I've actually replaced this gasket so it's still pretty free. So just double check you haven't missed anything. Everything's disconnected. And we can just sort of wiggle this up. So whenever I move the top from a carburetor, I always have these gaskets rip on me. This is one that I've actually made up in the past, and it is still in good condition, but the original Toyota ones always get stuck, and they usually rip and become no good. So if that happens to you, you can trace around the old gasket with some gasket paper like this, and then you can just make your own new gasket, and it works just fine. Okay, so this is the underside of our carburetor. As you can see here, this is our float bowl vent, which basically vents right on top of the float. So any fuel vapors that need to evaporate will come out of here, rather than spill down into these two venturis here and flood the engine. Next off, we have this accelerator linkage here. This is a uh, leather washer that runs up inside a bore inside the carburetor body itself. And you want to make sure that washer's in good condition. This one looks perfectly fine, so we'll just leave that alone. Over here we have a power valve, so this is a uh, cylinder that can retract into the carburetor and it can actually switch a valve in the actual carburetor body itself. And this, uh, this port here connects the top of that cylinder to the intake manifold, basically through the centre of the carburetor through a passage. So when the intake manifold vacuum is high, this retracts into the carburetor and it, de um, and it decouples the valve. When the intake manifold is low, you have your foot on the gas, this will actually pop out and enrich the main circuit, providing more fuel, so that's what the power valve does. And of course over here, this is our float. So we have a needle and seat underneath there. When the float level raises, that'll close the seat off and then maintain a constant level of fuel in the float bowl. As you use more fuel, this will go down and let more fuel in. So all we need to do to pull this float out, so you just pull the pin out, just like that. Here's the float. If you want to adjust the float height, you just simply bend the tab and then you can get the desired float setting. Here is the needle. It has a tapered rubber seat on the end of it, which goes down onto that brass insert, which is in the carburetor body. There is also a strainer inside of here, so if you unwind that, there is actually a fuel strainer. And then sometimes that can get clogged up with rust and debris and whatnot over the years. So if you're having fuel starvation issues, that could be something you want to check. Having a look at this needle here, you'll notice that the centre portion is actually spring-loaded. And I have actually seen on one carburetor this not returning, and we couldn't figure out why it was flooding. And this was actually the reason, so that's another potential issue. This one looks alright. But when you check your float height, you don't want that to be fully depressed. You want that to be fully retracted so the float barely touches the top of this. So here's a quick demonstration on how to set the float height. So we have our float here, and as you can see the needle has that spring-loaded mechanism in the centre, and we want the float to not be completely depressing that, but just to be sitting on that, resting on that just like so. And what we want to do is measure the distance between the carburetor's mating surface and the highest point of the float. So as you can see on the ruler there, that is 8mm. And that is what it should be set at, according to the Toyota factory service manual, or the Haynes manual. So we know that we're okay there. But should that float be out of spec, you can just bend this tab in or out here. So here's the carburetor body itself. We have our two Venturis, as you can see. One thing that you want to probably do is just check the torque on these four screws here, that hold these tubes into the actual body, because they do become loose and the gaskets do crush up over time. So check those are tight, because most of the time I've seen those are a little bit on the loose side. Here we have our check valve for our accelerator pump. As you can see, there's our fuel nozzle there. So you want to make sure that the bits from this do not go missing. This one is just basically a brass weight, but on some of them they have an aluminium weight with a spring behind it. So you want to make sure that whatever you have, you don't lose the parts to that. 
Of course, underneath that is a small ball bearing. And then we've got a spring for the accelerator pump itself. So you want to make sure that doesn't go missing. Over in the float bowl here, this is our power valve. This is what that plunger presses against when the uh, vacuum is low on the intake manifold. And that delivers more power to the, uh, to the main running circuit. Underneath there we have our two jets. So we have our secondary jet there and we have our primary jet there. So we can pull those out. To get those out we just need to unscrew these. So you get a 14mm spanner onto that. And then there's one more on this side. First we'll need to undo this nut and remove this linkage assembly. So just a 10mm spanner on that and we can just carefully remove that. Okay, so we've got those plugs out once we remove that accelerator linkage. Now all we need to do is poke a flathead screwdriver into there and we can remove that main jet. So here we have our primary and secondary jet. As you can see, the diameter of the primary is a lot smaller, and the number stamped on it is 101. And the secondary, as you can see, it is larger, and the number for that one is 165. So I have seen a lot of the time these jets do actually vary from carburetor to carburetor, even for the same type of car, engine, whatnot, so that's something to keep in mind. So right down in here, we have our idle jet. So we can unscrew that with a flathead screwdriver and remove it from the carburetor body. That's what it looks like removed from the carburetor. So here is our idle jet here. On this particular carburetor it is stamped 45. And if we have a look at the end, you can see the hole there is actually really, really small. So it's actually quite easy for this to get clogged up with debris. Although it's not present on this carburetor, if you take a look at most carburetors on a lot of cars that have been on the road for many years, You'll notice that there is a lot of sediment floating around the bottom of the float bowl. There can also be fuel deposits and varnish from when fuel dried up in the past. And these can be problematic for carburetors, they can clog small passageways and whatnot. So that could be a potential issue. If you do have this problem, you want to clean everything out with carburetor cleaner and then blow it all out with compressed air. Make sure that everything is as clean as possible. And then you want to reassemble it very carefully in a clean environment so that no contamination can get in there. So I've just gone ahead and removed the ball and the weight from the accelerator pump. That's what you'll find inside of it. So here we've removed the two emulsion tubes. And as you can see, there's a whole bunch of cruddy gaskets still stuck down to there. So we need to scrape that off and make up a new gasket. You can see the butterflies down the bottom there. So we need to make sure that these are as clean as possible. Okay, next thing we want to remove is this solenoid here. So we're just going to literally put a 12mm wrench on there and unwind that from the carburetor. We just want to make sure that o-ring on the end is okay and make sure that it actually clicks when you put 12 volts on the end of this. Okay, so now that we've got the carburetor disassembled, we can start cleaning all this up. Best way to do this is just to soak it up with some carburetor cleaner. This is good at removing all the fuel deposits and varnish that get left behind over the years. And it's good at removing the uh, sediment and whatnot that might get stuck in the passages in the bottom of the float bowl. So once you get that all cleaned out, you can hit it with some compressed air and just make sure everything is as clean as possible. The only other problem that you might encounter is wear on the primary throttle plate. These carburetors are a little bit prone to wear on the brass throttle plate, and they actually wear out of round, and they can actually bind in the throttle. So I've already got a video outlining the problem here, but these carburetors do have a tendency to actually wear the primary throttle plate, which is the smaller one here. They usually end up eating into one side of this cast iron bore on the carburetor's barrel and it'll actually wear the brass plate out of round. And when it does that, it causes issue with the throttle not completely returning to idle. So if you have issues with your throttle plate not closing and the car idling too high, it'll usually be because of this. Basically unscrewing those two Phillips head screws with a good quality screwdriver, flipping the plate round seems to have fixed it in my experience although it's not generally considered the best practice. So just a quick look at the uh, bottom side of the carburetor while we're here. We have our idle mixture screw here, and that passes right through over to that small hole in there. And then just by the throttle plate there, you've got a slot. This is also part of the idle circuit. Those holes around it are connected to vacuum lines. So when you have partial throttle, most of the fuel will be coming out of that hole there. When you open up the throttle, the Venturi vacuum increases and then you'll start to draw fuel from the emulsion tube and it will start coming from the primary jet. So once you have the carburetor all stripped down, cleaned, everything is good and you're happy with the way everything is, we can reassemble this now. 
These time lapses are just far too shaky. I don't really know how much I'm putting them in. It's just, 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 just to make the video longer. Time lapses. It's not even really full of content. It's just some crap video footage that's been sped up lots. So how many of you actually watch my 2E content? Me. I do. know I do. Me too. Oh yes, I do. My God. Cameraman's done it again. This, this camera, camera is, is too shaky too for, fast me. for me. I don't, I don't like it. feel good. Also, I don't really why like does this channel have no subscribers? The video is worse than the production quality of this. Is I don't really good. like this. this is all it's gone so hard. I find the looks of it. This is horrible. It should be There's way too much why anyone would want to watch this. I can't hear a damn word. Everyone keeps talking over the top of each other. This is just absolutely ridiculous. I wouldn't even listen to any of this crap. So two things I need to look out for when I put this choke assembly back together. This catch here needs to locate onto this spring over here, just in front of that white cam. And then this coil spring here for the choke mechanism itself has to go on this side of the choke flap so that it will spring shut. So as you can see, I have that one on there. And then this choke assembly here, I'm just going to rotate that so that it can go over the top of that. And then rotate that into place. And then to verify I got the choke in the right position, it'll spring shut like that. So when I put my auto choke assembly back together, I've clocked that to the center notch on this carburetor. That's a good starting point and we can always adjust it from there if we need to. Okay, so now we're all back together. Only trouble I had was getting this uh, green linkage back on to its pivot point. There's not a lot of clearance between this aluminium piece here for the auto choke and this actual pivot point for the flap. So probably a good idea to put that on before you put this assembly back on. But other than that, we're all good. So here we have our fast idle speed control, and this will actually slow down the engine according to the temperature of the coolant. And this is done with those two bimetal vacuum switching valves on the intake manifold. There's a black one and a yellow one. And when the temperature increases enough, it'll actually apply a vacuum to this, and it will pull on this lever, and it's actually going to pull on this green cam, which I actually show you in the first video. And it will actually close the throttle like so. So that will return the uh, carburetor to its base idle speed, as opposed to the fast idle speed. This big dash pot underneath here controls our secondaries, but the secondaries are also mechanically interlocked so that they can't stay open if you close the primaries. So this port here actually makes its way up to the valve cover on the engine, and there's a PCV valve located on the top, and that will purge the crankcase gases out of the engine and it will suck them through to the intake. So when you're checking the level of fuel in the carburetor, make sure that the vehicle is on a flat level surface. And you want to make sure that the fuel is no lower than the bottom tang on that window and no higher than the top. Okay, so now that we have the carburetor reassembled, just to show you, if I pull on this lever here, you can see that that breaks the choke. It will open it up. And that angle is quite hard to explain, but it's probably best to show you. You can see the angle of which that plate is. And it's basically pointing right down to the very bottom ridge of that air horn assembly, as you can see there. So that's basically where you want it. Any more or any less, you might run into issues. You might find that this rod here is actually bent, or someone's actually moved that or bent it in the past, so that could be a potential issue. So check that. Wow, you made it this far. Congratulations. That must have been one boring video. I mean, I wouldn't want to watch it. It's a bloody terrible video. This is the worst video I've ever made. Anyways, hopefully you learned something from it. Thank you for watching.